the second pledge of Aqaba had changed the equation considerably for the Muslims. They now had a new refuge in Yathrib, and its people were ready to protect them. Soon the Prophet, peace be upon him, received revelation about migration to Yathrib. He told his companions, I have been informed that we will one day migrate from Makkah to a land of dates. I think that it is either Yamama or Hijr. On another occasion, he, peace be upon him, said, I have been shown the place to which you will migrate. It lies between two hills of lava. It is either Hijr or Yathrib. Taking advantage of this new haven that had been offered to them, several Muslims migrated to Yathrib following the pledge. The first emigrant was Abu Salama Makhzumi, may Allah be pleased with him, the husband of Umm Salama, may Allah be pleased with her. He attempted to migrate with his wife and children a year before the second pledge of Aqaba, but his clan would not allow him to take his family, so he was forced to migrate by himself to Yathrib. A year later, Umm Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, was allowed to join her husband. Amir bin Rabia, his wife Layla bint Abi Hathma and Abdullah bin Umm Maktoum migrated after Abu Salama. Getting away proved difficult though because they had to slip out of Makkah past the watchful Quraysh. Umar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him however, left Makkah in full view of the Quraysh and no one dared to try to stop him. He also took 20 others with him. Soon, nearly all the Muslims in Makkah had migrated to Yathrib. Even the refugees in Abyssinia made their way there after hearing about the pledge at Aqaba. However, Abu Bakr, Ali, Suhaib and Zayd bin Haritha, may Allah be pleased with them, stayed in Makkah together with those Muslims who were unable to migrate. The Prophet, peace be upon him, stayed on in Makkah as well, awaiting Allah's permission to leave. He asked Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, to wait with him. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had two very fast camels and he would feed them acacia leaves to make them even stronger and swifter. This way, he and the Prophet, peace be upon him, could make a speedy escape once Allah's command to leave Makkah came. The Quraysh were enraged that the Muslims had found a place in the Arabian Peninsula itself where they would be able to thrive. They also feared that the Muslims would become strong enough to control the northern trade routes and disrupt the pagans' trade. Since the Makkans depended on the goods carried by caravans to and from northern Arabia and Syria, their fear was not unfounded. There was also the growing worry that the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself might escape any day to Yathrib, where his followers awaited him, and that he would set up a new power base, an eventuality which had to be avoided. To discuss their concerns, a special council was held at Dar al Nadwa. Most of the prominent chiefs of the Quraysh were present. Iblis, Satan, was also present, disguised as Sheikh Jalil of Najd. Abu al Aswad opened the meeting by saying, Let us drive Muhammad, peace be upon him, out of our territory and be rid of him. That will set the matter right. Sheikh Jalil didn't like this idea. Do you not see how sweet his words are and how he wins the hearts of people? If we exile him, he will simply find another tribe and make them his followers. With their help, he will attack your city and deal with you as he pleases. Think of another plan. Let us imprison him until he dies. He will experience the same kind of death poets of old did, Abu Bukhtari suggested. Sheikh Jalil interjected again. By God, if you make him a captive, the news will reach his companions who love him more than their fathers and sons. They might raid your territory and free him. Once their numbers increase, they will return and conquer you. Think of another plan. Finally, Abu Jal, himself a rival of Satan, put forth his idea. I have my own opinion, he began. I see that none of you has touched on it so far. We should select a strong and smart youth of noble birth from each tribe. Each youth will be given a sword, sharp and deadly. These young men will move toward the Prophet as one man and strike him as one man. Since all the clans will share his blood, Banu Abdul Munaf, Muhammad peace be upon him's protectors, cannot take on all the Quraysh at one time. They will then have to accept blood money 
that we can pay it off easily. This is the best plan of all, Sheikh Jalid declared approvingly. The council disbanded, relieved at having a solution at hand. Now it was time to make the necessary preparations. Meanwhile, Jibril, peace be upon him, came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, with the tidings that Allah had ordered the Prophet, peace be upon him, to migrate. Jibril, peace be upon him, told him the exact time he should depart and inform the Prophet, peace be upon him, of the plot to assassinate him. Don't sleep in the bed, you usually sleep in, he advised the Prophet, peace be upon him. At noon, when everyone was napping, the Prophet, peace be upon him, went to the house of Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, and told him the happy news. Quickly, they began to prepare camels for the long journey. They also hired Abdullah bin Uraik at Laythi to lead them to Yathrib. Abdullah knew the area between Makkah and Yathrib well, and although he was not Muslim, he agreed to escort the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, secretly. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told Abdullah to meet them near Mount Thor in three nights. Meanwhile, the Prophet, peace be upon him, began to engage himself in day-to-day activities so that no one would suspect that he was about to leave Makkah. The Prophet, peace be upon him, used to go to sleep after the evening prayer and upon waking up around midnight, he would go to the Kaaba to perform supplementary tahajjud prayers. The night the Prophet was to leave, he asked Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, to sleep in his bed after assuring him that no harm would come to him. When everyone had gone to bed, the assassins surrounded the Prophet, peace be upon him's house. They saw Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, wrapped in the Prophet, peace be upon him's green mantle, lying in the Prophet, peace be upon him's bed, and thought he was Muhammad, peace be upon him. The plan was for them to lie in wait for the Prophet, peace be upon him, and fall upon him when he came out of his house. The Quraysh were unaware that just as they were plotting, Allah too was plotting. Remember how the unbelievers plotted against you to imprison you, to kill you, or to exile you from Makkah. They plot and plan, but Allah plans too. And the best of planners is Allah. Quran 8, 30. Although Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, was in the Prophet, peace be upon him's bed, the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself, was still in the house, surrounded by the assassins. The Prophet, peace be upon him, came out of his house and took a handful of dust which he sprinkled above the young boy's heads while reciting the following verse. I have placed a barrier in front of them and a barrier behind them. I have covered them so they cannot see. Quran 36, colon 9. The youths outside did not see the Prophet, peace be upon him, leave. He went swiftly to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, and together they travelled not toward Yathrib, but in the opposite direction, toward Yemen. Before dawn, they had covered a distance of about five miles, and then they took refuge in a cave on Mount Thor. Unaware of the Prophet, peace be upon him's escape, the would-be assassins continued to wait for him to come out of his house. Only at dawn, when Ali awoke and came out, did they realise that they had been tricked. They interrogated Ali about the Prophet, peace be upon him's whereabouts but he pleaded ignorance. They then dragged him to the Kaaba and kept him captive there, but he divulged nothing. Then they rushed to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him's house, and found that he had also disappeared. However, they did find his daughter, Asma, who refused to tell them anything. Her calm defiance enraged them, and a furious Abu Jal slapped her so hard that her earring flew from her ear. The Quraysh began searching for the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Abu Bakr, and announced that there was a reward of 100 camels for each fugitive brought back, dead or alive. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Abu Bakr arrived at the cave on Mount Thor, Abu Bakr entered first to clear away anything that might injure the Prophet, peace be upon him. He found a few holes and stuffed them with pieces of cloth. The Prophet, peace be upon him, then entered and went to sleep with his head on Abu Bakr's lap. Suddenly, something stung Abu Bakr's foot, but he did not even twitch, fearing he would wake the Prophet, peace be upon him. The pain was so intense that tears began to run down his cheeks and onto the Prophet, peace be upon him's face. The Prophet woke up and saw that Abu Bakr was in pain, 
he then applied his spittle on the injury and the pain disappeared. For three consecutive nights, the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Abu Bakr remained hidden in the cave. During this period, Abu Bakr's son, Abdullah, would pass his nights nearby. The clever young man would return to Makkah so early in the morning that the Quraysh had no idea that he had slept elsewhere. Each day in Makkah, he collected information about the activities of the Quraysh and each night he updated the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. Abu Bakr's slave, Amir bin Fukhayra, may Allah be pleased with him, would graze Abu Bakr's goats near the cave so that both men could drink fresh milk. Early the next morning, Amir would drive the goats back to Makkah along the same route that Abu Bakr's son took to obscure his footprints. Meanwhile, the search party scoured the area south of Makkah, where the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Abu Bakr were hiding. Once, the Quraysh even came upon the mouth of the cave, and had they looked down while standing at the edge of the cave, they would have surely found the men they were hunting. With the Quraysh so close to discovering their hiding place, Abu Bakr became very tense about the Prophet, peace be upon him, safety. The Prophet, peace be upon him, reassured him, how can you be apprehensive about two with whom is a third, especially when the third one is Allah? On the first night of Rabil Awal, Abdullah bin Uraika Tulaythi, the guide hired by the Prophet, peace be upon him, to take them to Yathrib, arrived in the valley of Mount Thor with Abu Bakr's two camels. Abu Bakr's slave, Amir bin Fukhayra, accompanied them. The guide first headed south toward Yemen and then led the small group westward toward the Red Sea. Before reaching the sea, he veered north toward Yathrib, taking a seldom-travelled route. They journeyed all night and half of the next day. Then they stopped, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, rested in the shade beneath the rock. Meanwhile, Abu Bakr found a herdsman who let him milk one of his goats. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, awoke, Abu Bakr gave him fresh milk. Then they pushed ahead. Perhaps it was the next day that the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Abu Bakr passed by the tent of Umm Mabad on the outskirts of Qadit, near Mashal, about 130 kilometers from Mecca. There they asked her whether she had anything for four weary travellers. She apologised, saying her goats were grazing far away, and the only one at hand was a small goat that was unable to stay with the herd and didn't have a drop of milk to give. The Prophet, peace be upon him, asked for permission to milk it, and when he did, milk flowed from its udders. He filled a large bowl with milk and first let her drink. After that, each of the travellers drank their fill. When they had all finished, he milked the goat again and left the bowl full of milk for the woman. After they resumed their journey, the woman's husband returned. Umm Abad told him what had happened and she gave him such a complete description of the travellers that her husband exclaimed, That was the man from the Quraysh that I've been hearing about. If I ever have the opportunity, I will join his followers. On the third morning, after the Prophet, peace be upon him's departure, the Muckans heard a voice echo through the streets. They were unable to find where it was coming from, because it was not the voice of a human. It was a genie, a spirit, saying, Allah, Lord of the people, bless those two companions who reached the tent of Umm Abad. In safety, they broke their journey, and in safety, they resumed it. Anyone who befriends Muhammad, peace be upon him, find success. O Quraysh, by driving Muhammad, peace be upon him, away, you have forfeited glory and dominion. Blessed is the tribe of Banu Qab. Their lady's tent became a refuge for Muhammad, peace be upon him. Ask your lady about the weak goat and the milking bowl. The goat will also inform you if you ask it. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his companions left Qadid, a man by the name of Suraka bin Malik bin Jushum Madlaji spotted them. He thought he would capture the fugitives and take them back to Makkah to collect the reward. As he charged ahead on his horse, it suddenly stumbled and he fell to the ground. Being superstitious, he drew an arrow to see how favourable the situation was. The arrow he drew was unfavourable, but greedy for the bounty, he ignored the omen and mounted the horse again. This time, his horse carried him close enough to the fugitives that he could hear the Prophet, peace be upon him, reciting the Qur'an. Abu Bakr nervously looked back, but the Prophet, peace be upon him, was unconcerned. 
This time, the forelegs of the horse sank into the sand and again the rider tumbled to the ground. Suraka cursed the horse and with great difficulty, he managed to pull the horse's legs out of the sand. But when he looked behind, he saw dust rising from the horse's hoof prints like smoke. He quickly pulled out another arrow to find yet another bad omen. Now he was convinced that he would not be able to capture the Prophet peace be upon him. He then called to the Prophet peace be upon him and surrendered. The travellers stopped and waited for him to come forward. Suraka offered them food, but they refused his rations. The Prophet peace be upon him did, however, ask him not to tell the Quraysh of their whereabouts. Suraka agreed and asked to be given a letter of safe conduct for future security. The Prophet peace be upon him asked Amir, may Allah be pleased with him, to write the letter on a piece of tanned leather. Suraka then returned toward Makkah. He told all of the bounty hunters he met to go back because he had already searched the area and the fugitives were nowhere to be found. The four travellers resumed their journey and on the way, the Prophet peace be upon him soon met Burida bin Husayb Aslami along with 70 or 80 families of his followers. They all embraced Islam and prayed the evening prayer with the Prophet peace be upon him. Burida migrated to Medina after the Battle of Uhud. The Prophet peace be upon him also met Abu Tamim Aus bin Hajr Aslami at Arj. At the time, the Prophet peace be upon him and Abu Bakr were riding the same camel because one of their camels had become weak. Abu Tamim offered them a camel and sent along a slave named Masood bin Hanida who accompanied them all the way to Yathrib. Although Abu Tamim became Muslim, he chose to remain in Arj. He would later prove useful to the Muslims in the Battle of Uhud by sending word through Masood, the slave, about the Makkans' advance toward Medina. When the Prophet peace be upon him reached the valley of Reem, he met Zubair bin Awam, may Allah be pleased with him, who was accompanying a trade caravan of Muslims returning from Syria. He presented the Prophet peace be upon him and Abu Bakr with sheets of white cloth. Fourteen years after becoming a prophet, on a Monday, the Prophet, peace be upon him, arrived in Quba, on the outskirts of Yathrib. The people of Yathrib, which was later named al Madina al Munavra, the city of light, had long awaited the Prophet, peace be upon him, and each day they would go to Hira and wait for him until the sun became unbearable. One day, the people returned to their homes after waiting a long time for the Prophet, peace be upon him. A Jew, happened to catch a glimpse of a small group of white-robed travellers in the distance. He called out, O oh, people of Arabia, what you have been waiting for has arrived. The Muslims lifted their weapons and rushed to meet the Prophet, peace be upon him. There was a great tumult as everyone ran to the edge of the desert to catch a glimpse of the travellers. The Prophet, peace be upon him, then turned towards the right and came to Banu Amr bin of at Quba. After reaching Quba, the Prophet, peace be upon him, dismounted and sat in silence. Now, those of the Ansar, literally the supporters, the name given to those in al Madina who became Muslim, who had not seen the Prophet, peace be upon him, thought that Abu Bakr, the Prophet, because his hair had grown a little grey. But when they saw Abu Bakr shade the Prophet, peace be upon him, with a sheet, they realised their mistake. The Prophet, peace be upon him, stayed at Quba in the house of Qulthum bin Hazam. Other sources, however, say that he stayed in the house of Saad bin Khatima. He stayed there for four days, during which time he laid the foundation of Quba Mosque. That Friday, he left Quba with Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. He sent a message to Banu Najjar, the house of his maternal grandfather. His kinsmen came to Quba with their swords hanging from their sides and joined the Prophet, peace be upon him, on his way to Medina. When he, peace be upon him, arrived at the settlement of Banu Salim bin Auf, it was time to perform the Friday congregational prayer. The Prophet, peace be upon him, led a hundred Muslims in prayer. After performing the Friday prayer, the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his entourage left for Medina. Jubilant crowds of men, women and children greeted him, and the narrow lanes of Medina resounded with their happy voices. Women and children sang their welcome in a song that even now is sung by Muslims in memory of that happy day when, like the full moon, the Prophet, peace be upon him, appeared among his people.
The full moon has appeared before us. We must give thanks when called to Allah. You who have been sent to us, bring commands that will be obeyed. As the Prophet, peace be upon him, rode through the streets of Medina, people would take hold of his camel's halter and invite the Prophet, peace be upon him, to stay with them. Let the she-camel go her way, the Prophet, peace be upon him, would say. She is guided by Allah. Finally, the she-camel knelt, but the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not dismount. The animal rose to its feet again, ambled ahead for some distance, and then turned back and knelt in the same place it had before. The Prophet, peace be upon him's mosque, Masjid al nabwi was erected on this very spot. Many people vied with each other to give shelter to the Prophet, peace be upon him, but it was Abu Ayyub Ansari, may Allah be pleased with him, who hurried to lift the saddle from the she-camel and took it to his home. The Prophet, peace be upon him, remarked humorously, a man must follow his saddle, and went along with Abu Ayyub. Asad bin Zurara took hold of the halter, so he was allowed to take care of the animal. The Ansar chiefs tried to outdo each other in welcoming the Prophet, peace be upon him. Each night, the Prophet, peace be upon him, would receive at least three or four trays of food. Everyone wanted the Prophet, peace be upon him, to know that he had found a new home among his followers. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, migrates. Back in Makkah, Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, stayed on for three days after the Prophet, peace be upon him, left. During this period, he settled all of the Prophet, peace be upon him's affairs in Makkah. He then left on foot and met the Prophet, peace be upon him, in Quba, where he stayed in the house of Khulthum bin Hadam. Six months after the Prophet, peace be upon him, had settled in Medina, he sent Zaid bin Haritha and Abu Rafi to Makkah. They came back with the Prophet, peace be upon him's family, Fatima, Um Khulthum, Sauda, Um Ayman, and Usama bin Zaid. Abdullah bin Abu Bakr also accompanied them, along with the rest of Abu Bakr's family, Um Ruman, Aisha, and Asma. The Prophet, peace be upon him's departure, triggered off a new wave of migration to Medina. The wealthy Suaib, also known as Abu Yahya, i.e. the father of Yahya, who had long been planning to migrate, only to be held by the vigilant Quraysh, finally managed to leave Makkah for Medina. The Quraysh were obviously trying to stop the flight of capital from their society, and Suaib struck a bargain with them. He would give them all his possessions and his wealth if they would let him join the Muslims in Medina. When a now penniless Suaib reached Medina and told the Prophet, peace be upon him, how he had won his freedom, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Abu Yahya, this bargain is crowned with success. Not all the Muslims were able to win their freedom and migrate. The Makkans rejoiced in the poorer Muslims' increased vulnerability and tortured them even more to make them renounce their faith. Valid bin Valid, Ayash bin Abu Rabia and Hisham bin As, may Allah be pleased with them, were among this group of unfortunate Muslims. In Medina, the Prophet, peace be upon him, would pray for them and supplicate against the unbelievers who had held them back. The Muslims remained patient, however, and were finally rescued by their brothers in faith and taken to Medina.